Well, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the latest in our series of the Bible as history. And in this series, we're looking at the historical background to events that happened in the Bible, because we believe that there is historical evidence to prove that our faith is true. It is based upon fact. Now, this afternoon, we're going to be looking at one of the epistles from the New Testament. An epistle is another word for a very long letter. And in the New Testament, there are a number of these letters written by various different people. And we're going to be looking at one this afternoon, which is the epistle or the letter to the Hebrews. And I'm delighted that I'm joined this afternoon by Jill Morley, who has been looking at Hebrews and studying it. And we're going to talk together about some of the historical background of this letter to the Hebrews. So thank you, Jill, for joining us this afternoon. So first of all, as with any letter, it's always good to know the person that wrote it. So can you tell us, who is it that wrote this letter to the Hebrews? Well, that's a very good question, Richard, because we don't know if that is the answer. It is interesting that when you look at practically every one of the letters or epistles in the New Testament, they begin by the author identifying himself, not only who wrote it, but who he was writing to. For instance, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans. He began his letter saying, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. And Paul did this it seems to me with every one of his letters, but this was not the case with the letter to the Hebrews. So we can't be certain who wrote it. But one interesting thing is I've discovered with Hebrews, you can pick out lots of little hints and uh, so on from the text itself. And in chapter two, we, we read that the, um, the, the writer speaking about our self, great salvation in Jesus put the words, this salvation was confirmed to us by those who saw him. So one thing we do know about the writer to the Hebrews is that um, he saw those who, who'd seen G Jesus, who'd been with Jesus, who'd um, seen what he'd done and heard his teaching. So it's nearly a first-hand witness, it's second-hand, but from those who, who knew Jesus. So, But that is virtually all we know about the person who wrote it. Having said all of that, we could say it was written by the Holy Spirit, uh, because it is a remarkable uh, letter and Christians all through the ages have consistently believed it was divinely inspired, whoever wrote it. And that's why it is in the canon of scripture. So yes. that's all I can say about who wrote Hebrews. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it is also true to say, as we mentioned about Paul, it's unlikely that he wrote it because the style of writing is totally unlike the rest of the letters that he wrote. And Greek scholars would tell us that the Greek that was used in Hebrews was different from that in Paul's letters. And so I think whoever it was that wrote it, it is unlikely that it was Paul. Yeah. But if we don't know who wrote it, maybe we might have some idea of the people that the writer was writing to. So can you give us some light on that, please? Well, again, nothing is given in the introduction, whereas in most other epistles, it's not only who wrote it that's given, but to whom. It would be either an individual or a group or a church or a group of churches, but there's nothing like that in the introduction to the letter to the Hebrews. But one thing we do know is it very likely it was written to a group of Jewish believers because for a start, we've got the name Hebrews. Yeah. So, you know, that suggests it was written to Hebrews, to Jewish people who are believers. And, and also, interestingly enough, the very opening verse of the letter says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Well, that must mean the Jewish people, because yeah. our forefathers through the prophets is the Jewish nation, the Jewish people. Yeah. And thirdly, um, the, the letter is absolutely full of quotes from the Old Testament and loads of references 
to various Jewish beliefs and practices that would not have been familiar to the Gentiles. So all we can say in answer to that question is it must have been to a, a group of uh, Jewish believers in Yeshua as Messiah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that, that that's fairly clear, then, isn't it? That it was written to Hebrew Jewish believers. Do we know when it was written? Again, I think probably like most of the epistles, no um, clear indication. But one thing I think we could say for almost for certain is it was written before AD 70, because that was the year that the Romans came in and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. And yet the writer to the Hebrews is writing about the, the sacrificial system, the priests and the sort of old covenant ways as if they were all still in action, uh, still continuing as normal. So uh, I'm sure it must have been um, before AD 70 and probably um, sometime in uh, from early 60s or mid 60s AD. I think that's the closest we can get. <laughs> OK, <laughs> thank you. And. These letters, all of them that are in the New Testament, generally there's a purpose, there's a reason why the writers would have written them. Paul yeah. wrote his letter to different churches to deal with issues in them. The other writers had their reasons for writing the letters. So why then was this letter written to these Hebrew believers? Well, there's several answers to that question. Um, I think one that we could start with is that um, these Hebrew believers really did need quite a bit of encouragement mm -hmm. because we learn from the letter itself that they were going through a really hard time and it was it had been going on for a long time. It, it was persecution in various forms. In fact, the letter tells us that they had been mistreated for a start for their faith because of their faith and they'd been publicly exposed to insult and persecution, which is really tough. And mm. some had been put in prison and others had had their property confiscated. But we learn all of these things from chapter 10. So we know for sure that these Hebrew believers were going through a very tough time. The good news is many of them had courageously held fast to their faith in the Lord and they'd stood their ground. We learn that too from the letter. Uh, and interestingly, Richard, looking at the background of the early church, it is um, wonderful that the early Christians realised not only that they were likely to suffer, just as Jesus had suffered for his, uh, for, 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 you know, mm. going ahead and going to the cross, but they were prepared to lay down their lives to be martyred for their faith in Jesus. And in fact, many felt there was no higher honour than to die for Jesus because he died and laid down his life for us. So that was really inspirational for us. Uh, although yeah. many in our world today, many Christians in other countries obviously face the same kind of challenges and persecution. But these Hebrew believers had been going through a, a prolonged period of suffering and struggling, and they really did need encouragement to stand firm in their faith. So that is definitely one of the reasons I think why this letter was written. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's right, because, you know, when believers are going through such persecutions, such encouragement is certainly needed. Yes. And the letter, as you say, does provide that encouragement for them. But as they were going through this persecution, do we know anything of those who were actually doing the persecuting at the time? Well, we're not told. Um, and it, it probably wasn't the Roman authorities at this stage, because in the 60s, the Emperor Nero uh, was ruling uh, from Rome and um, that persecution of Christians had begun uh, from the Roman authorities. Mm -hmm. but at that stage, it was more on a localised basis rather than throughout the empire. So we don't know exactly who it was, but you only have to look at the book of Acts to see that early Christians were persecuted by both Jews and Gentiles. So that's all we can say, really, in terms of background as to who was doing the persecuting. Mm. OK, and obviously, as we said, that as this persecution was taking place, these believers needed to be encouraged. So in what way does the author, does the writer to the Hebrews actually encourage them? What does he do to provide that encouragement? Yes. Well, firstly, he does point to uh, Jesus. I've just 
reminding them how much Jesus suffered and to, to encouraging them to take heart that they were in this respect following in his footsteps. He, in Hebrews 12, we read, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you do not grow weary or lose heart. So one way he encouraged was just keep going, don't lose heart, you're following in the master's footsteps. But he also mentioned another wonderful thought, which was that he said, do not throw away your confidence because it will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. So that there were these two main strands of you're following in Jesus's footsteps. So don't grow weary, don't lose heart, but remember at the end of all of this, a wonderful reward awaits you for being faithful and persevering. So th those were two of the ways amongst others that he, he encouraged these Christians. Mm. And hearing that would be a real encouragement to them to know those two things, that those are definitely ways in which the believers would have been encouraged. I'm sure th those have been encouraging to anybody who's gone through any sort of persecution or difficulty. Yes, absolutely. But I do wonder, even though these believers are going through difficulties, persecutions, was there anything that the author might have needed to say in terms of warning huh. or maybe, you know, to try and correct things at the time? Because that, that can sometimes happen in these situations. You're, you're absolutely right, Richard. There's a, a constant sort of balance in the letter between encouragement, but also warnings. And um, my thinking is that these Christians were going through a hard time. And I, I know it's a temptation for any of us if you are being severely um, opposed and perhaps yeah. ridiculed and suffering, that you could be tempted to compromise, it's just to make life easier for yourself and to ease the pressure. Yeah. And unfortunately, some at least of the Hebrew Christians were beginning to compromise and it was serious. So first of all, the writer warns these Christians, don't, be tempted to drift away. You've got such a great salvation. Hold fast to it. Yeah. Don't let yourself sort of be distracted and drift away. So that was the first of the warnings. And then a little bit further on, he warns them not to harden their hearts. And as we perhaps all know, when you're opposed, it can be quite easy to sort of harden yourself and hit back or, um, or even turn against the Lord and feel, why am I having to mm -hmm. suffer in this way? Why isn't God helping me? And it's without doubt rather like the Jews in the wilderness who started to grumble and harden their heart against the Lord after their great deliverance from Egypt. It would seem as though there was a possibility that some of the Hebrew believers were grumbling and hardening, mm -hmm. and even sort of being deceived by the temptations of the, the old sinful ways and going in that direction. So that was a really serious warning and then others just seem to be becoming lazy yeah. and bothering to sort of um, work at their faith and learn and grow they were remaining immature rather like infants and not going on and growing it towards maturity so these were all warnings that he had to uh, you know spell out to the Hebrew Christians whatever you're going through just be on your guard don't don't drift don't harden your hearts don't become lazy. And another thing is, don't be tempted to turn back to your yeah. old faith, you know, the, Ju the Judaism that they had been um, part of before, which was not just their faith, but their whole way of life. And there was this temptation that life might be easier if they slip back to Judaism. So that was just a few of the warnings that he gave. Yeah. Um, OK, just pick it up on that last point that you made about going back to Judaism what was it about that that would have been so appealing why would that have been attractive to them to go back to their old religion yes well um Richard I think probably many of us if we've come from non-Christian backgrounds can get quite a lot of um, opposition from from our own family members mm. or friends we're no longer the same anymore we're not fitting in with their values and their beliefs and their ways and they can be the starting point to persecution. And this could so easily have happened to the believers, uh, Jewish believers, that their families turned against them and may have rejected them and even threatened them with disinheriting them or something like that. 
So there could have been the temptation to go back into um, fitting in with family and friends. So that was one possible pull to go back to Judaism, go back to your old familiar ways and, um, you know, fit in with family and friends. So that was one possibility. And another one might have been that, of course, the um, Jews had all, the, they had the temple, they had all their tradition that went back centuries. It was part of their way of life. But being a Christian, there were no church buildings, no traditions, and they could have um, longed for the old reassuring, comforting ways uh, that they had moved away from, which they no longer had. But maybe, possibly, a, a, another huge temptation to go back to Judaism was that at this point in the 60s, um, the Romans weren't persecuting the Jews at all, from what I can gather. So Jews were completely free to meet in their synagogues, carry on their normal practices. And um, if the Jews, if the Jewish believers could go back into that, they wouldn't have to worry about persecution at all. So mm -hmm. I think that there were those three aspects that were, were, were drawing them back to, to their old faith, their old ways. Hmm. Yeah, so perhaps I'd just like to elaborate on that in that if the believers were thinking they would go back, why would that have been such a bad thing? What would have been wrong with that? Well, that's a very good question, because thinking about it, all of their faith uh, in uh, as, as Jews was all instituted by God himself. So, for instance, um, God sent his prophets and spoke to the Jewish people through the prophets. God sent his angelic messengers and spoke through them. God sent Moses and gave them the law and Aaron and set up the, the priestly system and the sacrificial system. So all of these things were given to the Jewish people from God himself. So there was absolutely nothing wrong with the old ways. Mm. The thing is, when Jesus came, in every way, what he came to teach and do and bring was superior. Really, Jesus is coming was the fulfillment of all the words and messages from the prophets and all, all the Old Testament practices were pointing to Jesus. So why move on to Jesus? It's because that, that's what God was pointing to. Yeah. And, and in every way, um, Jesus and all that he did was far, far superior. And really the book of Hebrews underlines that point again and again and again. Um, Jesus was uniquely the son of God. None of the prophets were, no angels, the son of God. Uh, and um, he's also was the la is the lamb of God. Yeah. The Jews had all their Old Testament, um, uh, sorry, Old Testament sacrifices of bulls and sheep and goats and so on. But none of those could take away sin permanently. They were only temporary. But when Jesus came, his death as the lamb of God took away the sins of all people through all ages. And once he died, it was done, it was finished. No more need for sacrifice. How wonderful that is, so Amen. wonderful. And, and perhaps a third point in which we can see how much better Jesus is. Once he had died for our sins, he rose and went back and is now seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven, where he reigns, in that place of highest honor and authority as king of kings and lord of lords and he's coming back a second time hebrews tells us christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to all who are waiting for him yes. so through jesus we have this wonderful hope not only of sins forgiven but his coming again in a as king of kings and to reign in a kingdom that is um totally ruled by righteousness and justice <laughs> and um, you know and it's an everlasting kingdom never will we go back to the old ways uh, that we're living in now in terms of injustice and uh, and corruption so it, we've got something through jesus to look forward to the likes of which the jews really knew almost nothing about so there's a few answers. <laughs> well, that, that's really brilliant. And it, it's always so great to come back to Jesus. And that is where 
our focus is and should be, isn't it? The praise and the worship of Jesus. That's what we're about. And indeed, even in, you know, this, this series, The Bible is History, yes, we're looking at the historical facts, but in the end, the reason that we're doing that is because we want to point to Jesus and what he has done. And as you say, this letter to the Hebrews does that in a wonderful way, points to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done. Well, can I just thank you so much, Jill, for this afternoon? That's been really brilliant and really lovely, great introduction to this book of Hebrews and the history of it. So to those of you who are watching, thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to find out more, you can get in touch with us via our website, which is trosnant.org. We also have a Facebook page. Please look that up, up at Trosnant BC. And if you want further to ask further questions, then please feel free to do so. So again, thank you for watching and may the Lord bless you all.